Let's absorb God's word of Proverbs 16. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. Be steadfast, by steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. An oracle is on the lips of a king. His mouth does not sin in judgment. A just balance and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his work. It is abomination to kings to do evil, for the throne is established by righteousness. Righteous lips are the delight of a king, and he loves him who speaks what is right. A king's wrath is a messenger of death, and a wise man will appease it. In the light of a king's face, there is life, and his favor is like the clouds that bring the spring rain. How much better to get wisdom than gold. To get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. The highway of the upright turns aside from evil. Whoever guards his way preserves his life. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. Whoever gives thought to the word will discover good, and blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. The wise of heart is called discerning, and sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. Good sense is a foundation of life to him who has it, but the instruction of fools is folly. The heart of the wise makes his spirit speech judicious, and adds persuasiveness to his lips. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. A worker's appetite works for him. His mouth urges him on. A worthless man plots evil, and his speech is like a scorching fire. A dishonest man spreads strife, and a whisperer separates close friends. A man of violence entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that is not good. Whoever winks his eye plans dishonest things. He who purses his lips brings evil to pass. Gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Amen. We're continuing our series through the book of Proverbs, fearing deity and defying stupidity. We come today to a section where the Lord is emphasized quite a bit. By the way, I've said this repeatedly, but the fear of the Lord, I believe, is the central theme, the central tenet that is woven throughout Proverbs. And an inexperienced reader of this book might see more of a man-centered emphasis than is actually there. For, some, for instance, some people might think, oh, you know, I'll read the book of Proverbs and I'll get some good advice for my relationships, and I'll get some good advice for how I manage my money, and I'll get some common sense principles for my life. And that's not untrue, but that's, of course, incomplete, because everything in this book rises or falls on the fear of the Lord. That's the central ingredient for wisdom in this book. And Proverbs 16 is going to emphasize in these first few verses the fear of the Lord, but it's going to go beyond that. It's going to, be go, it's going to go beyond just emphasizing the fear of the Lord and emphasize the sovereignty of the Lord. Solomon is going to do some, 
some big picture theologizing in these first nine verses of Proverbs 16. And then everything else in the chapter just flows from that, that focus on the Lord. So just to show you the focus on the Lord in the first few verses, let's, let's do some data analysis. I know you all love this, but just stay with me as I nerd out a little bit on this. So the book of Proverbs has a total of 915 verses. Y'all got it? And the word Yahweh or the Lord is used 87 times in those 915 verses. So that's roughly a reference to Yahweh every 10 verses. Y'all with me? And yet, look at verses 1 through 9 of chapter 16. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Yahweh, 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 Yahweh. Y'all see that? In every verse, in the first nine verses, except for verse 8, there's an emphasis on that covenant name for God, Yahweh. Do you think Solomon's trying to emphasize something here? At least one of the things that he's trying to emphasize is this. And this is the title of the message today. The Lord reigns. The Lord is sovereign over our world. Here's your outline for today. I want to show you in the text the sovereignty of the Lord, the purpose of the king, the wisdom of humility, and then finally, the fragility of mankind. There's sovereignty at the beginning, there's fragility at the end. Sovereignty describes God, fragility describes man. That's a, is that a good way to sum up the differences between man and God? God is sovereign, man is fragile. Let's start with the sovereignty of God. Solomon writes in verse 1, The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. What does that mean? What in the world does that mean? It means that man proposes, but God disposes. Man has his plans, but the Lord has the last word on everything. It means that God sovereignly orchestrates everything in this world, even the very words that come from our mouths. The, the passage that comes to mind here is that, that wonderful passage in the book of Numbers where that, that dopey guy Balaam gets hired to curse the Israelites. Y'all remember that? And, and he goes to curse, and every time he tries to curse, this blessing comes out. And, and the Lord is controlling his speech even in that moment, this crazy sorcerer. And, and if you remember, the guy Balak who hired him was furious. I hired you to curse the Israelites. What are you doing? Well, the Lord controls even the words that come out of our mouth. And to that, you might say, but yeah, Tony, in our day, some people do say wicked things about the Lord and his people. Yes, that's true, and that's where verse 4 comes in. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. We'll get to that in a moment. Look at verse 2, emphasizing still the sovereignty of the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the Spirit. Now, this is a truism, so don't absolutize this for every man in our world, seeing his ways as pure. What Solomon is saying here is that, generally speaking, man is oblivious to his own sinful patterns and ways. He thinks what he does is fine. Actually, it's embarrassing sometimes when you watch TV and you see men and women who who are absolutely convinced in their wicked way of seeing this world. It, it's, it's a kind of delusion that takes over people. And they're just espousing these things that you know are untrue, but they're doing it with such conviction. Y'all with me? Anybody else see this? We don't watch TV, Pastor Tony. Good. It's probably better. In fact, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, speaking of this delusion that's common to mankind, the God of this world has blinded the, mind, the eyes of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So there, there's a blindedness that we, we don't even know, that, that our ways are unpure, and yet we see them as pure. And Solomon is clear here, it's not man who ultimately judges another man. God weighs men's hearts. The Lord weighs the Spirit. Y'all might remember that, that great moment in Daniel 5 where Belshazzar is having this feast and he used all of the, the accoutrements of the, the Israelite temple and, 
And that disembodied hand shows up and starts writing on the wall. Y'all remember that? I remember even as a kid reading that story, and I was like, ooh, that's awesome. And what did that hand write? Many, many tackle parson. What did that mean? Well, Daniel showed up later, and he says, you have been weighed and found wanting. And that gives you shivers too. And Belshazzar was so terrified in that moment, he practically soiled himself. Weighed? Weighed by whom? Who weighs men's hearts? The Lord weighs the Spirit. Look at verse 2. The Lord weighs your heart, your spirit. And that's why Solomon says in verse 3, commit your work to the Lord. That word commit in Hebrew more literally is roll. So it has the idea of rolling your deeds, rolling your work, rolling your lives even onto the Lord and just letting it go. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't weigh things on your own. Don't live a godless, prayerless, man-centered life. Solomon's dad said it best in the book of Psalms, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. An atheist in the Old Testament world is a fool. And only a fool makes plans and fails to acknowledge the sovereign God of the universe. And David submitted his life and his plans to the Lord. I know David had his flaws. But do you remember when when David wanted to build a temple for the Lord and he made all these plans and and even at first the prophet Nathan said, go for it, this is a good thing. But then later Nathan says, it's not going to be you, it's going to be your son. You're not going to build a temple for the Lord. David acquiesced. He subordinated his plans ultimately to the Lord. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Eventually Solomon was able to fulfill that plan. And and speaking of atheists and foolishness, and one who says there is no God in his heart, now we're ready for verse 4. Now we're ready for, how does does wickedness play into this equation of sovereignty, Pastor Tony? The Lord has made everything for its purpose. Everything? Everything? Everything Everything for its purpose. Even the wicked for the day of trouble. You might wonder to yourself, when these wicked people in our world on TV or elsewhere do evil, why doesn't God just take them out? Maybe you pray imprecatory prayers to that effect. Just take them out, Lord. Why doesn't God just zap evildoers with lightning? Does anybody else pray for these things? Maybe it's just me. That would be great if he, you know... Evil shows up, zap. What's the problem with that? We wouldn't have made it past like age four if God operated that way. If he was zapping evildoers, we'd be like, everybody but me, Lord, please. And God has his ways. God has a long view of things. God doesn't just give instantaneous retribution for our sin. Thank God for that. God has long nostrils. Even with us, he is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. And in some mysterious way that humans don't understand, God has a purpose even for evildoers in our world. He has a purpose. Yahweh even says this in the book of Isaiah, I form light and I created darkness. I make well-being and I create calamity. I am the Lord who does all of these things. He is sovereign over everything. Look at verse 5. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. The Lord is slow to anger, but he's not devoid of anger. Y'all with me? The Lord has long nostrils, but he still has nostrils. And there will be a reckoning, and he'll sort out evil and good in his perfect timing. Some of you might say, I've done some wicked things, Pastor Tony, in my life. What's my hope for the future? It says, he will not go unpunished. Am I going to go unpunished? Well, look at verse 6. Here's some hope for you. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. Anybody in this room got some iniquity they need atoned? 
Anybody in this room, there weren't enough hands raised when I asked that question. Got any sinners in this room that need saving by grace, by the atoning work of Christ Jesus on the cross, and by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil, says Solomon. Now there's some debate as to whether this steadfast love and faithfulness that atones for sin in verse 6, is that our steadfast love and faithfulness or is that God's? And I'll just say, this is my view, those two Hebrew words, chesed va'emet, that show up quite a bit, they're typically used of God. Not always, but typically. And I think this is a reference to the Lord's chesed va'emet, the Lord's steadfast love and faithfulness. And we know by the fuller revelation of the New Testament that God's steadfast love and faithfulness caused him to send his son to this world to die on the cross for our sins so that our sin might be atoned. How is our sin atoned? How is our wickedness paid for? How can we have peace with the God of the universe? You don't do that by compensating for your evil by doing good works. That ain't going to cut it. You need a Savior. And sure enough, we have one. We have salvation through our Savior, through faith in Christ. Look at verse 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Verse 8, better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. Amen. The heart of man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. The Lord is sovereign over our steps. And some of you might ask, should we, should we, should we even plan our ways then, Pastor Tony, if The Lord is sovereign over everything. Should we even bother? Yes, you should. Yes, you should make plans. The Bible doesn't allow for a philosophical or theological fatalism where you just throw up your hands and, well, the Lord's sovereign, so I'm not going to do anything. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches sovereignty, yes, but also we have a personal responsibility to do what God says and to trust his sovereignty over those things. So yes, make plans. Yes, seek the Lord. Yes, pray things out before the Lord. Here's how, and and as you're making plans, here's some advice. So the Apostle James in the New Testament, this this is biblical planning. He says in chapter 4, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. That's a good way to kind of just check your heart and remind yourself of what even Solomon is saying here. If the Lord wills. I've called this in the past the Deo Valente verse. Deo meaning God, Valente meaning wills. So sometimes if I send an email or I send a text message to people at the end, I just write Deo Valente. I'll meet you. I'll be there for coffee. I'll come play basketball with you, Deo Valente, if the Lord wills. Why do you, why do you say that? Why, why are you always deferring to God's sovereignty? Because, look at verse 9. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. I want that deferential talk coming out of my mouth and out of my thumbs as I'm texting people. You might say it this way. Let me give you something memorable. Mankind proposes, but the Lord disposes. Mankind formulates, but the Lord validates. Y'all with me? Mankind forms, but the Lord performs. We devise, He verifies. The sovereignty of the Lord. Write this down as number two. There's also here in chapter 16 the purpose of the king. And this, we need to interpret this accurately. Remember, this is an ancient book part of a context in an ancient world. And this book, Proverbs, was primarily written by a king, King Solomon. And that king had a part to play in the nation of Israel. So I want to assess these verses from that vantage point. And then we can talk about the applicational thrust of this for us. But Solomon writes in verse 10, and this is a little, I don't know, unnerving to us Americans. An oracle is on the lips of a king. His mouth does not sin in judgment. Now, what is Solomon saying there? 
Do kings sin? Yes, they do. Solomon's the perfect example of that, right? And David, for all of his goodness and, and fearing of the Lord and being a man after God's own heart, he was a sinner too. But what Solomon is writing here, he's, he's idealizing the Israelite king. The king was supposed to function as this perfect leader over the people. He was anointed. He was called to mediate between God and his people. Therefore, his lips authoritatively declared the judgments of the land. He was the authority over Israel. And the great example of that is Solomon. When those, those two women came to him fighting over this one baby that was alive and there was another baby that was dead, and Solomon had to adjudicate this issue. And he said, well, let's split this live baby up and give one half to one mother and one half to the other. And he knew by saying that in that little ruse that the true mother would, would show up. And also that the, the, the faker, the mother that was trying to trick him, would show herself as well. And sure enough, that's what happened. And he, he used the wisdom that God gave him to adjudicate a matter in his kingdom. There was no constitution in Israel. There was no Congress. There was no political process of passing a bill. There was just the king and his word. And the king's word was the law of the land. He mediated between God and his people, and the people had to obey him. For their own benefit, they had to obey the king, even if that was disadvantageous to them. So you might say, what happens when the king sinned and failed as this mediator. Well, the Lord judged him. That's why every king is recorded as doing either what was right in the eyes of the Lord or what was evil in the eyes of the Lord in the book of First and Second Kings. The Lord judges his mediators on behalf of his people. So look at verse 11. So that's the context here. That's why the, the king language here is, is said so authoritatively. Just balance and scales are the Lord's, verse 11. All the weights in the bag are his work. Implicitly here, kings abide by what the Lord has established as just balances. Verse 12, it is an abomination to kings to do evil, but the throne is established by righteousness. So yes, kings can do evil, but that's an abomination when they do that. And it's an abomination as well when they tolerate it, evil doing in their kingdom. That's not the kind of king that God wants to rule over his people. Look at verse 13. Righteous lips are the delight of a king, and he loves him who speaks what is right. Again, think of an idealized king in a perfect world. We know that Solomon's son, Rehoboam, did not delight in those people who spoke right. We know that Solomon's son actually rewarded those younger people who gave him bad advice. And by doing that, he split the kingdom between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. We know that King Ahab similarly listened to lying prophets instead of truthful prophets. And that brought disaster on himself and also the people of Israel. Verse 14, a king's wrath is a messenger of death, and a wise man will appease it. In the light of a king's face, there is life, and his favor is like the clouds that bring the spring rain. In the ancient world, again, you could rise or fall in an instant based upon your, your relationship with the king and on the whims of the king. I'm not saying that's good. I'm just saying that's the way it was. And God sanctioned that role as king to rule over his people. And some of you, you know, all this talk about kings, you know, we're Americans, right? You might say, I'm so glad we don't have kings in this country, Pastor Tony. I agree. I, I think democracy is a better way. Democracy has its glitches. I agree with Winston Churchill who said, Democracy is the worst form of government in the world except for all the rest. So it's the best of all the bad options, but I will tell you this. Actually, let me ask it this way. What if instead of an idealized king who failed all the time, like the Israelites in the Old Testament, or like the British monarchy for that matter, what if you didn't just have an idealized king? What if you had an ideal king? who ruled perfectly and justly and never sinned and never made a mistake and always ruled with the right judicious actions. 
That perfect monarchy, I'll tell you, is better than democracy. And that's the perfect monarchy that we look forward to, that I would even say Solomon prophesied, and we look forward to it at Jesus' return in his millennial kingdom. Would he, a perfect monarchy, will trump all democracy in our world? Write this down as number three. Solomon now transitions, verse 16, to talk about humility and and wisdom and the wisdom of humility. If you'll notice, Solomon doesn't mention the king at all in verses 16 through 24, so he's moved on from that subject. And he only mentions Yahweh once in verse 20. The focus of this section is, transitions to human interaction with one another, and the focus becomes wisdom, exercised through persuasive speech and humble hearts. And this is the logical response of what precedes it. If God is truly sovereign over our world, then we should fully embrace humility. If God has appointed kings to rule, then our response to that should be humility. So, verse 16 How much better to get wisdom than gold? To get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. Lady Wisdom said almost the same thing in chapter 8. She said, my fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield is better than choice silver. And then she threatened us. You better listen to me or else. And remember, hell hath no fury as Lady Wisdom scorned. You better heed her counsel. And by the way, the options here presented, it's not like get wisdom or just be happy in your lack of wisdom. The option is wisdom or death, as it's presented in Proverbs. It's get wise or get wrath. Look at verse 17. The highway of the upright turns aside from evil. Whoever guards his way preserves his life. Pride. Y'all heard this before, verse 18? Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Church father John Chrysostom said that the tyranny of pride estranges us from God's mercy. And that's because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And that's because pride goes before destruction. When I played high school basketball, I would quote this verse to my teammates sometimes, or some version of it. I would would tell them when when they would get kind of egotistical, pride goes before a fall. And that was like my, my catchphrase, one of them anyway, which was kind of rich when I was in high school because I had my own issues with pride. I wasn't exactly a, a paragon of, of virtuous humility when I was in high school. Nevertheless, I would say that sometimes to my my fellow teammates, and they would kind of mockingly recite it back to me. Tony says, pride goes before fall. And and even in the realm of basketball, you can see that to be unteachable, to be uncoachable, to not be willing to listen or to learn, to be so self-inflated that you don't grow, that you don't mature, that you don't get better, that's going to hurt you in the long run. And the higher you climb in your own estimation of yourself, the harder you fall. And that's why verse 19 says, it's better. It's better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. Y'all remember Jesus' parable of the wedding feast in Luke 14? It's a great parable. Jesus said, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, don't sit down in the place of honor like like a dope just walking in like, I'm here, then let the party begin. No, what does Jesus say? He says, instead, give your place to another person and and then you will begin. If you do that, you know, your place is going to be given to somebody else. You're going to be shamed in front of everybody. He says, instead, but when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. Then Jesus said this. Tell me if this sounds like the book of Proverbs. 
For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. It's almost like Jesus read his Bible or something. Like he knows the book of Proverbs, and he used it and even expanded on it with this proverb. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Speaking of the Bible, look at verse 20. Whoever gives thought to the word will discover good. And blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. Do you know why I give thought to this word from the Lord? Do you know why I agonize as a Christian to know God and to read this word and to understand him? Do you know why I trust God? Because I know the wickedness and the sinfulness and the weakness and, and the pathetic nature that I am apart from God. And how desperately I need this revelation from the Lord. The Lord knows how ridiculous the thoughts inside of my head are apart from his word. And I need this. And whoever gives thought to the word will discover good. And who, whoever trusts in the Lord will be blessed. The Lord treasures and loves and blesses the one who treasures and loves him. Look at verse 21. Y'all still with me? 21. The wise of heart is called discerning and sweetness of speech. How y'all doing with this? Your speech. If we thought we had mastered it, Solomon just keeps coming back again and again and again to talk about our speech. And I love the framing here, the sweetness of speech. The sweetness of our speech incre increases persuasiveness. Lord, help us with that. Give us more sweetness of speech. Good sense is a fountain of life to him who has it, but the instruction of fools is folly. That's, <laughs> verse 22, that's an ironic statement. The instruction of fools is folly. It's like saying the intelligence of the unintelligent is unintelligent. There is no instruction, real good instruction anyway, among fools. Their instruction is foolishness. Verse 23, the heart of the wise makes his speech judicious. So not just persuasive, but judicious. You, you're, you make the right choices as to what you say, and you know when to not say anything. The heart of the wise makes his speech judicious and adds persuasiveness to his lips Gracious words, look at verse 24. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. There's that sweetness of speech. Talk again. It's almost like the Lord wants us to get a better handle on our tongue or something. He wants us to be more gracious with it, more judicious with it, more persuasive with it, less abusive with it. You know, in the ancient Hebrew world, nobody would have said, nobody, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Nobody would say that. They knew that words hurt. And y'all know that too, that that little playground ditty doesn't work even in our day because words hurt. But the opposite of that is that words can also heal. They can give health to the body. Literally, Solomon says at the end of verse 24, health to the bones. You can heal somebody's bones. Gracious words give you healthy bones. And Solomon, I love this. Solomon compares these gracious words to what? To, to honey from the honeycomb. You know what's fascinating about honey? Honey is one of the rare commodities in our world that is both good tasting and good for you. Do y'all know that? Both. Squash, so they tell me, is healthy for you. Squash tastes like death. And I hate it. I keep telling Sonia, God didn't intend us to eat this stuff. And I actually think that you know, if, if you grow squash in your yard, you should just put that right in your compost pile after you're done harvesting it. There's no good use for squash. But honey, if you like squash, I'm sorry. 
Fill in your vegetable of choice. Rhubarb. I heard somebody say that. Rhubarb. I don't know why anybody eats that. But honey, here's, here's the contrast. Honey is good for you, and it tastes good. I have a friend in Illinois who's he's the president of a, the Beekeepers Association in Decatur. And if you, if you get him alone and talk about honey, he will wax poetic about the, the benefits of honey and how it's good for us, and it's not like refined sugar, those artificial sweet sweeteners that'll kill you. And what does Solomon... Look, here's the point of all this. What does Solomon use that ancient, proverbial commodity for goodness and sweetness to describe? What, what is like honey? Gracious words. They are sweet and health-giving to your soul and to your bones. Here's the word for gracious, by the way. Here's your Hebrew word of the day. It's the word noam. And it means pleasantness. And the name, Naomi, is derived from this word. Do you remember Naomi in the book of Ruth? Remember what she said when she came back to Israel? They said, is that Naomi? Don't call me Naomi. Don't call me pleasantness. Why did she say that? Because her, her husband was dead, her, her boys were dead. She came back with nothing other than this daughter-in-law who's is behind her. She said, don't call me pleasantness, call me Mara, meaning bitter. I'm, I'm a bitter old woman because of what God has done to me. And that all, if you've read the book of Ruth, you know that changes all at the end of the book. And she goes back to Naomi. She goes back to pleasantness because of what God did for her. Here's what's pleasant and not bitter. Here's what's noam. Gracious words. Like honey. And then finally, Solomon gives us this summation of the fragility of mankind. Solomon says in verse 25, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. We've seen that sentiment before in the book of Proverbs, in chapter 14, verse 12, and elsewhere. Rich Mullins used to sing, we are not as strong as we think we are, and that's true. Verse 26, a, work, a worker's appetite works for him. His mouth urges him on. Why do we work in this world? What, what's this talking about? Why do we endure those thorns and thistles in the workplace. It's not because we have an endless amount of joy whenever we work. Even Look, even brain surgeons get tired of brains. Even engineers get tired of engineering. If you are an engineer, don't amen that. We all know it's true. Even pastors get tired of Greek and Hebrew. Even Golfers get tired of golf, professional golfers anyway. But we got to keep working no matter what we do. Why? Because you got to eat. And that's what this is speaking to. And this is, the, this is the antithesis of laziness, which we see several times throughout Proverbs. The slothful person, the sluggard. Your mouth, your appetite urges you on. Why do we have to work so that we can eat? Why do we have to eat? Because if we don't eat, we die. We're weak. We're fragile. Now look at verses 27 through 29, because 25 and 26, those are pretty innocent verses, but now fragile man becomes wicked man. Because in the next few verses, you've got, look at verse 27, you've got a worthless man. Verse 28, you've got a dishonest man. And then in verse 3, you have Hamas man, you have a violent man. And then, in verse 30, you've got a, a winking man, which you know, is, is some kind of deceptive gesture. I don't even know what it means. And all of these, by the way, in verses 27 through 29, including 30, these are not antithetical parallelisms. These are synonymous parallelisms. In other words, Solomon is not contrasting good with bad. Don't be like this, but be like this. Instead, he's just giving you bad, 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 bad all the way through here to show the wickedness and the evil and the, even the fragility of humankind. 
And if there is a contrast to be had in this, it's not, you know, in the parallelism itself. It's between what's said here and what's said at the beginning of chapter 16. God is sovereign and we are not. God is holy and we are not. So, verse 27, a worthless man plots evil in his speech. This is a vivid metaphor. Is like a scorching fire. A dishonest man, verse 28, spreads strife and a whisperer separates close friends. That's true. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen even with brothers in Christ who part because of rumor mongering and gossiping. It's like, it's like Iago from, from Hamlet's Othello, if you've ever read that play, where where. Iago gets in there and spreads and whispers lies about Othello's wife, and all of a sudden Othello thinks his wife is his enemy. Look at verse 29. A man of Hamas entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that is not good. Whoever winks his eyes plans dishonest things. He who purses his lips brings evil to pass. I don't know what those gestures mean. I've talked before about squinting or maybe blinking. Some kind of nonverbal gesture that you would signal to another person. It's time for evil. Or you're deceiving somebody. The gesture that I thought of is like, you know, you cross your fingers and hold them behind your back and you say something. And supposedly, y'all ever done that? You know, kids, like supposedly if you do that, you can tell a lie. It doesn't even matter. Of course, we know that's ridiculous. But that's the idea here, that there's body language that's used to deceive or to bring about some evil. And then, so, so that's evil, fragile, wicked mankind. Verse 31, this is, this is not a statement about evil, necessarily. But is it, 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 is, it is a statement about fragility. Gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. Ladies of Verse by Verse Fellowship, your gray hair is a tiara. Y'all wear that proudly. Men of Verse by Verse Fellowship, Mike's going to amen this again. Your gray hair is a crown of glory and splendor. You've earned it. Now, do some people who are unrighteous have gray hair? Yes. But this is a truism. And the idea in the ancient world, you all know this, is that there's a value to the aged. There's a reason in the New Testament leaders of the church are called elders. It's because with time and experience and, and a few lessons learned in the school of hard knocks, there's wisdom and there's righteousness that's typically formed. Look at verse 32. Remember the, the long nostrils analogy? Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Having long nostrils is better than having great strength. Controlling your emotions is a tougher task than conquering the city. Tsar Peter, the king of Russia, said once, I can govern my people, but how can I govern myself? I can't get a hold of myself. Look at verse 33. Now Solomon brings everything full circle. He's talked about the fragility of mankind. Now he comes back to God's ultimate sovereignty. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Translation, God is sovereign over everything. Even the lots that we cast to make decisions, even the lottery that was used to send people off to war in our nation's past, even the, the, the ways they determine who gets a, a kidney or a heart transplant, that there's some randomness even in that, all of those things are ultimately determined by the Lord and He is in control over all of them. By the way, this, this word, lot, we get... Some of our English words from that word, that old English word, 
We talk about somebody's lot in life. We talk about our allotments in our world. And what Solomon is saying here is that seem, the seemingly random events in human life, the, every single detail of your life, the seemingly inconsequential elements of your life are ultimately controlled by a sovereign, all-powerful God. Does that make you all uncomfortable? God's sovereignty? It shouldn't, but it does for some people. So Spurgeon said this. He said, no, doc no doctrine in the whole word of God has more excited the hatred of mankind than the truth of the absolute sovereignty of God. The fact that the Lord reigns is indisputable, and it is this fact that arouses the utmost opposition of the unrenewed human heart. Look, i got about three minutes, and I'm going to bring together God's sovereignty and human responsibility in the next three minutes. Buckle up. And if I don't cover it all, then we'll deal with it on Tuesday in the, the podcast. Sometimes people have a negative, visceral re reaction to the truth about God's sovereignty. And, and that's because we like to think of ourselves as in control. I am the master of my own fate. So we think. And yet, I will say this. The reality of God's sovereignty should be a comfort. Would we rather have a God who's not in control of this world? That's terrifying. And it's not really what we want. I want a God who's sovereign or I don't want a God who's sovereign. The Bible clearly presents a God who is sovereign over this world. And at the same time, I don't know if we can ever put this together ultimately in our feeble human minds. He calls us to account. He calls us to act. He calls us to do. He calls us to put our faith in Him. And somewhere underneath the rubric of God's sovereignty, there is an expectation that we do right by the Lord. And God's sovereignty shouldn't disturb us. It should comfort us. And you might say, well, what about the evil in this world, Pastor Tony? God's sovereign over that. That bothers me. Why do all the bad things happen in this world? Well, I already gave you verse 4. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. However you parse God's sovereignty and human responsibility, you've got to take these passages into account. And I, I, like I said, I don't think a full grasp of this humanly speaking, is going to be possible. That doesn't mean we can't search these things out and believe what the Bible teaches here. And I will tell you this, even though it's difficult to understand why a sovereign God allows evil things in this world, I admit, that's difficult. The theological realm of that is called theodicy, and books like Job and other books like Ecclesiastes deal with theodicy. But I'd rather believe in a God who is sovereign over the things of this world than a believe, in, believe in a God who is caught unaware, like, I didn't, did that happen? I didn't know that was going to happen. That's not the God of the Bible, and that's not the God you want. Ultimately, the God who reveals himself in Scripture, that God is a sovereign God. He's an omnipotent God. He rules over everything. And here's what's amazing. If, if you come to terms with that, the all-powerful nature of God, then it makes the truth of our salvation that much more precious because that all-sovereign, almighty God of the universe, He limited Himself. He took on human flesh. He came into this world that He created and He died a brutal death on a cross for your sins. He's a sovereign God, but He's a loving God. And beyond just dying for you on a cross, He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to know you. He wants to hear your prayers. He wants to talk to you. He wants to give you His Word. We don't deserve that. And we have this opportunity, this amazing opportunity, in light of what Jesus has done for us, to know 
and to have a relationship with and to love and to serve that sovereign, all-powerful God. Do you all know Him that way? Not just as this, this God of transcendence that's so far removed from you, but also this God who is imminent and near and loves you and died for you. You can know Him. He wants to know you. and He wants you to know Him. Pray with me. Lord, we acknowledge the truth of Scripture this morning. The reality of a God who created the world and is sovereign over everything. The ends and the means. And Lord, our feeble minds can't put together, not perfectly, that paradox of your sovereignty and, and our own human responsibility. But Lord, we believe what the Scriptures say. And Lord, we believe that the person who puts their faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on that cross will be saved Lord, I believe that the truth of that biblical doctrine gets richer every day. And Lord, we're here this morning to say thank you, to praise you, to worship you as that almighty God who who in your grace and your love for us died for our sins. So thank you for that, Lord. We worship you. Lord, awaken the hearts of the people in this room, I pray, to this truth. May those who don't know you put, put their faith in Christ. And may we who know you and love you, Lord, would you grow our appreciation of these truths. Help us to understand, Lord. Your sovereignty, your power, your all-consuming nature, your hate for sin, and your love for sinners saved by faith.